The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to television writer and producer Ann Lewis Hamilton, who previously has worked on episodes of Haven, 30-something, Grey's Anatomy, and Party of Five. She's just, she's just published her first novel, Expecting, and it is one comedy of pregnant errors after another. Stick around. I promise not to ask anything significant about Grey's Anatomy. Okay, maybe promise is too strong a word. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, brought to you today by Amazon.com. When you visit MrMedia.com and click on any of the links to purchase books, music, movies, gift certificates, or anything else through our Amazon link, you support this free video podcast. Whenever you need something else from Amazon, please consider returning to MrMedia.com to order it. It doesn't cost you any extra, and we sure appreciate the support. And don't forget, MrMedia.com has more than 1,200 celebrity audio and video interviews archived on the site. That's hundreds upon hundreds of hours free entertainment. Subscribe for free on MrMedia.com and you'll instantly get an email every time a new interview is posted. You can also watch and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Vimeo, Daily Motion, The Realm Network, and Frequency.com. And if you prefer to just listen, Mr. Media is also available for free on iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Podfeed.net, and Player FM. You can subscribe to any of those services and never miss another episode. Finally, you can interact with Mr. Media interviews on all kinds of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and more. Friend or follow us, we'll friend or follow you back. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of extremely expectant mothers who think all men are inherently evil and should be stopped from doing further damage to the women of the world at all costs in the new New Media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Yes. Lori and Alan are a professional couple having frequent sex because, well, they're happily married and want to have a baby. You know, procreation. Jack is having a lot of sex because he can. Oh, and because he's found a way to get paid for it. You know, recreation. There is no reason on earth for their lives to cross until they do. And then all bets are off in terms of guessing where Anne Lewis Hamilton's first novel, Expecting will take the reader or the characters. Expecting grew out of the author's personal experiences with infertility, to a point. Then, I suspect, her experience as a writer and or producer of popular TV dramas such as Haven, The Dead Zone, Grey's Anatomy, Saved, Providence, Party of Five, and 30-something probably took over to drive the narrative. Now, I think you'll enjoy Expecting, whether you are or not. And I can't wait for this interview to be over, only so I can see how the book ends. Because as is my usual practice, I set the book down with about 30 pages left so as not to inadvertently give away the ending. Anne Lewis Hamilton, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, and congratulations on expecting. It's, uh, it's quite engaging. Thank you very much. I'm really happy that you liked it. Like it. You're in the process of liking it. Uh, yes, and I, I, you know, I, 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 whenever possible, I put a, a novel down near the end if I'm going to interview someone because I do not want to be responsible for like, you know, being like the spoiler uh, king. Can't do it. That would be awful. It would, right? I mean, you know, you're coming on here to sell books, and if people already know how it ends, why should they buy the book? Right. It's true. And but- I don't. I don't have people on whose books I don't enjoy, so I want you to sell a lot of books. That's good. All right, let's do that. Let's yeah. do I want you and you and you, especially you, buy this book. Good. Yay. Yeah, that's easy. You almost don't have to do the rest of the interview. All right. Well, I got to go. <laughs> so, all right. So tell us a little bit how you drew uh, and to what degree you drew from your own experience in writing, expecting. 
Um, well, like you said, my husband and I had some fertility issues. Uh, we decided it was time to get pregnant and got pregnant kind of instantly. You know, the minute we decided, you know, to, to, to try, boom, you know, we were pregnant um, and sort of assumed that everything would be fantastic and I had a miscarriage. Um, and that was a surprise um, and really pretty depressing. Um, and then we decided to try again, and boom, I got pregnant instantly again um, and had um, my son, my son Max. Um, it's, I don't know, I think it's an interesting story, but at the time I was on 30 something, and when I had the miscarriage, I told the producers, Ed Zwick and Marshall Herskovitz, um, I told them I'd had a miscarriage. They called. They were, you know, really, really sweet. Um, and Ed Swick and I were talking about how it's great when you're a writer, how you're able to write about something when something awful happens to you. Um, and Ed said very, very kindly, he said, who knows, maybe we'll have to write a miscarriage into the show sometime. And if you would like to write that, you know, that would be, you know, we would offer that to you. Um, and I said, yeah, that fine, great. Um, a couple months later, that it happened. They needed to have um, Mel Harris have a miscarriage, and they said, you know, Anne, if you would like to write it, that's great. If it's too hard for you to write it, that's great too. And I said, give it to me. I want to write it. I really want to write about, you know, just like an early miscarriage because you know there are big stories about stillbirths and things like that. And I and I wanted to write about my experience, so I did. So this is a long story. The long story short part is. Um, the night the episode aired, uh, I watched it with my husband. My husband, like a lot of 30-something episodes, because I was writing about my marriage, my husband would watch it going, you know, ah, you know, what, what is she saying about her marriage? Um, so the night the miscarriage episode aired, uh, we went to bed, and I got into bed, got up like an hour later, went to the bathroom, and my water broke. And it's because I was pregnant then, and we went to the hospital. And so my son was born the day after the miscarriage episode aired. So I think that's a pretty cool story. That is a pretty good story. And, and, just, and it gives me the opportunity to mention that I, I come from the same hometown and went to the same high school as Mel Harris. Really? So there. <laughs> yes, props to North Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, that was always weird. She was older than me. I just like to point out, though. Oh. Um, so, now is that where the similarity ends? Because there's. Oh, you mean in terms of your what, story what, in the book? Yeah. Well, you know, then you know it was like, wow, you know, pregnancy. Wow, that's you know, it's pretty easy. Yeah, you have a miscarriage. You know, then you have a baby, and then I couldn't get pregnant again. Um, and, and just, you know, nothing seemed to work. And so my husband and I started looking into, you know, meeting with fertility doctors and, and we went down that road and we really did. If, if you've gotten that far in the book, there really was a fertility doctor that we went to who said, I'm the one who can give you a baby. And my husband and I, you know, said, no, we, we hate this guy. Um, so we went to, um, another guy that we liked very much, um, got pregnant again, uh, through IUI, like in the book, um, and then I had another miscarriage. And by then it was like, you know, this just stinks. You know, we weren't, we didn't really want to do the in vitro. It, it, you know, it was just, you know, it was really depressing and disheartening. And people had talked to us about adoption. And so we looked into foreign adoption and sort of the fertility journey was so kind of, it was, it was like, a slog and a grind and depressing and you know shots in your butt and and you know your temperature all this stuff and looking into adoption was so positive it was sort of like you could change like an infant's life and and it was it was so much more joyful and so we went down that that road um, and so we have a daughter uh, Lucy so it's kind of great to have like a birth child and an adopted child. So it, it all ended up, you know, well. Um, the journey was, the infertility journey was pretty stinky, though. Yeah, and yeah. So you never actually had the experience of maybe a little mistake at the clinic. No, but my husband did, you know, because we did IUI, 
and and you know sort of the indignities that that both husband and wife go through with this process um you know it was like i had dye like injected in my tubes you know and they follow like you know where like the dye goes you know i think my husband was like oh you know my poor wife my poor wife and then you know they said to him you know we're going to check out your specimen we need a specimen and like a lot and my husband was like oh no um, so that that journey for him wasn't, you know, really terrific. But he did make the joke when we were doing the IUI. He said, "I hope that's me," you know. I, you know, wouldn't it, and I thought I did file that away, and I thought, well, that would be kind of interesting, you know. If suppose there was a disgruntled employee who just kind of switched around like all the, you know, little samples, you know, and created havoc. So that was. That was how my twisted mind. That's a brutal yeah. moment in the book when you when you you, you you realize that that's what happened, and it's just someone who was pissed off at their boss that day, and yeah. the damage that one person can do in that situation potentially could do. Hopefully, that it can't happen. But the reality is, hey, it could probably happen. It probably does happen. Well, right. actually, there's a story, isn't there? A, there's a current story about a couple. That used a fertility, and um, she got pregnant, had a baby, and the baby, uh, she was white, the baby was black, and they're mm-hmm. suing. I think that's going on right now, actually. I- there, there are a couple. There was, there was, there was a family on um, the Today Show where I think it, they'd gotten pregnant, and the woman had a baby, um, and it turned out it was like another couple's baby. And so they, I think they very kindly gave the baby back to the other couple but that that would be pretty brutal um, I, I know i know we had our daughter 18 years ago there was my wife was nervous as all get out about leaving her in the nursery uh you know overnight because well how do you know they're not going to get swapped how do you know blah, blah. i said well you know this is what they, they do this and they do that she said i want you to stay with the baby i said no i will take the baby <laughs> to the nursery and i will take pictures of the baby and what the baby looks like and you know all that kind of stuff but no i'm not staying overnight in the nursery next to the no 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 we're just going to have to have a little faith in the hospital well you know we know we all know the stories the the movie switched at birth and all that kind of stuff so um all right so let's talk about the there's three main characters in your book um there's uh alan and Lori, they're the married couple who i referenced in the introduction and they're they're happily married they're both professionals and they want to have a baby and she's had they've had a couple of miscarriages they uh go to this uh for infertility or fertility specialist depending on how you describe it and then there's jack who's a college student uh an indian college student if i'm uh, not mistaken so i've said that much now if you would just tell folks just a little bit more about each of these characters and kind of what's going on with their lives as we get to know them well i mean laurie Lori obviously is is based a lot on me, and I think she has that um, like a professional woman who who getting pregnant just like me assume that you know you get pregnant you have a baby you get pregnant again you have another baby it just it just happens it's really easy um, some of that is based on me that I was the first of my group of friends to have a miscarriage and and I and I remember just going now wait a minute how come this happened to me you know so um, so Lori experiences that um, I think she's probably more patient than I than I am uh, Alan, her husband, is somewhat like my husband. He's not as, he's not as, uh, I think he, my husband is more um, emotionally connected than Alan is. Alan tends to keep things inside. And, you know, I don't want to give away too much, you know, from, from the book. Um, when I was writing it, you know, I talked to my husband a lot about, honey, honey, what would you do if I got pregnant, if I got pregnant and, you know, it wasn't your sperm? You know, what would you, you know, how would you feel? And I really wanted to have uh, a male perspective. I really wanted to know what, you know, what a man would think. And he was, you know, he was pretty honest. And he said, you know, I, I don't know what I would do. He said, I don't know how I would feel connected with the baby. Um you know, I mean, so so I tried to put a lot of that um, in the book. I mean, and it's interesting that we went on to adopt because 
we sort of didn't have that um, we didn't have that fear of lack of connect, connection with adoption. Mm -hmm. There was something about a woman who's pregnant, married to a man, and he like watches her belly grow, and it's he knows it's it's not him, you know, it's not his. So he's about to have a baby, and the baby is going to be could be look Indian, um, and not look like him at all. Uh, so. I mean, I think that's that's pretty interesting. Well, and yeah, let, let's talk about that for a minute. I want to ask you about Jack, the uh, uh, Indian college student, in a minute. But <clears throat> since you mentioned that about about your husband and about uh, Alan in the story, I have to tell you that I felt actually very sympathetic to Alan uh, in the course of reading the book. And I don't know if that's you look surprised. I don't. Yeah, I, yeah uh, because I felt like. And you just described it. I mean, if you if you if if you and your spouse pursue uh, adoption, it's because you've chosen to pursue adoption for whatever reason. Maybe you you can't get pregnant, or you don't want to go through that, or you know that there's a lot of kids already in the world who need homes. All great reasons, perfect. Whatever you as your, as a couple decide, that's great. If um, in the other situation, if uh, you and your spouse uh, cannot conceive a child of your own and you choose to go through in vitro and you're using sperm from a sperm bank, for example, or an egg or whatever the case may be, and you have it uh, implanted. Again, power to you. That's wonderful. Do that. Um, but what's different here in the story, and again, without trying to give away too much, is that they're trying to get pregnant using their own, his sperm, her egg. That's their intention. He's all for it. He's, he's participating and, you know, that's all happening when the when lori understands that she's pregnant but it's not her husband's sperm where i where i feel for him and and continue even though he he does some stupid things <laughs> um i i'm completely in in alan's corner throughout the book because she unilaterally decided we're keeping this baby i'm keeping this baby you don't even have a say in this and you can just sit back and watch me, as you put it, you know, ba the baby's growing and not feel a connection. Well, of course he doesn't feel a connection. A, it's not his child. And B, this is not a path that he chose to be on with her. If he had, oh, and then he, if he had chosen this path of getting a sperm donor and then he pulled away, then he's a big asshole. Right. But in this case... I, I felt for him entirely. I, I thought, I don't know that I would be any differently, any different than he is. And I thought, I like to think I'm a pretty, you know, involved uh, husband and dad, and I'm supportive of my wife. But if my wife unilaterally tells me she's going to carry a baby to term that is not mine and has no reason being there, you know, uh, I'm afraid I might be very similar. And I don't, of course, I don't know how the book ends. I haven't read that far. Um, and I, I, I would be right there with Alan I think I'd form a support group for him well I didn't when I when I was writing it I didn't I think um, uh, I didn't want to do I, I think in an, in an early draft there was like a whole lot about abortion the potential for abortion and I thought and I wrote it and I thought well this is such a can, big can of worms and I I didn't want to go there I mean it, it just I mean if if Alan really talked about that I mean, he really seemed like an asshole. And, and it just, and even like the idea that they would give the baby up for adoption, you know, just seemed kind of, you know, it, it just was a little, it was a little fraught. Um, so, I, and my husband and I talked about this, and I think John, my husband, said something like, um, wouldn't it be great if we could get a do-over? And I, and I loved that expression. And he says that, he says that kind of in the middle of the book. It's just, it's sort of, I wish we could just get a do-over. And it's, that's not, you know, that's not an abortion or giving up a baby for adoption. It's just sort of a, a general, um, why did this happen to us? So, um, in, in earlier drafts, he was, he was a little schmuckier. Um, and some people who read it earlier said, I want to like him more. Um, and so I did work on him, um, a lot to make him, uh, you know, sympathetic, but I, I feel his pain too. I mean, it's like, 
you know, I think it's I think it's fairly early in the book where he talks about, you know, and I know our daughter is adopted from India. And, you know, and when you choose to do that, you, you're facing a life of me walking down the street with my daughter and people going, oh, is your husband from India? And you, it's like, no, you know, she's adopted, blah, 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 blah. And so Alan is like looking at a lifetime of, oh, did you adopt your baby? And, right. oh, you're not the father. And, you know, that would be a hard thing to deal with. Well, I mean, I, and I completely understand that abortion is a very touchy subject that, you know, you could walk down the street and uh, risk offending, obviously, at least 50 percent of the people, depending on what you say about about abortion. This was an odd situation. I was, I have to admit, I, this is one area of the book I thought may have been a little, uh, little bit weak. Is this? I thought there would have been more conversation about that. In that, if if she had, because she knew early on that she was pregnant with the wrong sperm, frankly, um, she could have aborted the fetus. I, I hate to say baby because then it's a it's a loaded comment. But she could have aborted, and they could have started over again. Right. With his sperm and and known that they got they got it right, instead she just unilaterally goes forward with this pregnancy, and and there's no here, I guess this is part of it. There's no indication that she went forward because she had religious feelings that abortion was wrong, or that she had a or maybe not religious but just morally or ethically, it was just kind of glossed over. And I thought I don't think I mean. Well, you worked on thirty something. Realistically, that could be a whole season of thirty something. <laughs> well, it's interesting because we I wrote an episode where the women characters talked about abortion and the male we got was, you know, and it was really it was it was pretty even. I mean, it was pretty the the women had a conversation about it like in the kitchen or something. And somehow it it I think in the editing somehow some of it came off as kind of casual um and it, the mail was just like, oh, the show, it, it's like so pro-abortion. Um, and so if anything, I probably did, I probably could have gone deeper into it, but I think I really was afraid of just, just saying, you know, abortion, just, you know, the idea that Lori would even consider it. It's like half the people reading the book would just toss it. It's just like, you know, oh, that bitch, she's going to like kill her baby. Ah, oh, I hate her. Just because it's somebody else's sperm, right. um, and so I mean, I think maybe I was too careful, um, but but I mean, I think I don't know. I think Lori was always going to keep the baby, but but she is. There is something that is a little selfish that she doesn't quite include it. Include Alan in right. her thought process. Right. She doesn't really think about how it's going to affect him as much as she could. So, hmm, so will they stay together? I don't know. Don't know. Say, I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna interrupt the conversation and ask you a completely unrelated question. Is there symphony music playing in the background at your house? Um, can you hear it? It's like yeah. very faint. Would you like me to turn it off? Maybe so. Yeah. <laughs> also, I don't want to have a copyright issue later. <laughs> oh. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I, I, oh, kept, sorry. I, kept, I kept thinking. I know it's not playing here. <laughs> I'm, I'm so used to having music playing all the time. Maybe she lives close to the Hollywood Bowl, and the, they're they're tuning up. I don't know. Okay, so uh, now we've talked about uh, ja- uh, Alan and Lori, the, the the young couple that are uh, trying to have a baby. Um, let's talk about Jack, the young college student. Um, his journey is a, I find it very interesting throughout the book, in that he and I think I, I dis- described him in the introduction as he's rather aimless, he's unfocused. Um, you know, he's just one of these kids. He's in college. He doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up. He doesn't know what he wants to be now. He's just kind of wandering through, following the crowd. Um, you do a really good job, I think, of getting into his head and and helping us to understand him. I, I almost feel better, feel like I, I understand his motivation and his thought uh, better than uh, better than Alan's at times. Huh. I mean that that's that's really interesting. I mean because because um, you know Jack is of the three characters. He's the the one not really based on a real person. I mean there, there's a teeny bit of my son in him, but um, but not not that much. 
Although when I was doing research, when I was doing all the research for sperm donation, um, I used my son's name like to get like all the information. And so every now and then I, I used a different email address. And every now and then I still get, you know, like for my son, it's just sort of like, hey, when are you coming in to like donate that sperm? <laughs> so I've told my son, it's like, hey, if you want to make some money, you know, just, you know, call this number. And, and How old is your son now? He's like 23. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure he's very grateful. <laughs> so, Thanks, so, Mom. That's a conversation I want to have with Mom. <laughs> so he could, yeah, he could do that. Um, so he's the one who's sort of, he's sort of made up. So it's it's kind of, and, and, and the, the book started, it was a short story. And the short story started with, um, with Lori getting the phone call that, basically said it's it's not your baby it's somebody else's sperm and so that was a short story and and she met Jack um, and then she like told her husband she'd met Jack and that was kind of the short story um, and then a writer friend said you know what this should be a book and I it really I just said I'm not right I hadn't written a book by that you know then and I was just like I'm not writing a novel I'll kill myself um, it's too hard uh, and then I ended up writing another book um, got a book agent. It didn't sell the first book. You know, pitched him some ideas for a second book. He read the short story and he said, "Hey, this could be a book." So, um, so I started writing it. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you know what Nano is, the write a novel in a month hmm. thing. Have you ever heard of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the it's November. It's so you the month of November you try to write fifty thousand words. Um, and so a couple Novembers ago, I, I, it was like, okay, I'm going to like dig in and try to, you know, write expecting and, and, and write it as a book. Well, the, the Lori getting the news about the switch sperm doesn't happen until, you know, what, a third of the way through the book. So I had to start at the, at like at the beginning, I had to like go back. Jack didn't really have much of a character and, but I was doing nano where you, you really try to write like 2000 words a day, which is really, really hard. Um, and, and I did, I mean, and I just sort of like sat at my computer and I just like went, Whoa! um, and, and Jack just sort of, he really, he sort of tumbled out. I mean, just, I kind of don't quite, I, he sort of came from some weird imaginary place and, and it was sort of like Megan and UCLA, and then I thought, let's add another girl, and let's just have him, you know, really be just totally lost, but you, you kind of love him. Um, so, and, and he, I love that he sort of has, a, it's a coming-of-age story for, for Jack. I mean, he's kind of growing up. I mean, you know, what, like, 21-year-old kid, you know, wants to get a phone call and be told, hey, you're the father of my baby. You know, it's like, what? It's like, I just, like, gave him my sperm. <laughs> you know, that's not supposed to happen. Um, so he was really fun. I mean, he was he was totally fun. I mean, I, I just I just adore him. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's so, he, I just, I mean, I think he, he's one of my favorites. I think the phone is ringing. The phone is ringing. Maybe it's Jack. This is real life interviewing, folks. We're not doing this in a studio. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like the phone's upset with you now. Now, my phone never rings. Oh, <laughs> now, now it's stopped. Okay. Oh. So, how does your uh, your TV experience writing for TV? How did it? When you get a chance, please return my call at four two five. Okay, sorry. Oh, hey. I didn't quite get her number. Come on. I know. <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, it's real, it's real life. What are we going to do? It's real life. So yeah. how did uh, how does your TV tr uh, dramatic training and, and experience, how does that uh, affect and influence your writing this uh, novel? Um, I think cer certainly like writing TV for such a long time, um, you know, uh, gave me the discipline um, it gave me just, I was kind of insanely spoiled that my first like real job was on 30 something and it was kind of film school like, and in that Ed and Marshall were such great teachers and they, they were such great, great teachers about, about writing and, and telling stories and, and how to do outlines and, and sort of, and the basics of that. 
and and that's sort of yeah. You know, I mean, I was really lucky to to start there, um, and I, and I tried to like you know use their you know what they taught me um, er, ever since. So so I mean, I was when I I took a writing class, uh, I don't know maybe four or five years ago. Um, and one of the short, I hadn't written fiction in a really long time, and one of the criticisms was, you know, where's the dialogue? There's no dialogue. And I thought, well, huh, that's kind of funny. It was like, can you write dialogue? And I thought, that's kind of the only thing I know I can do. Right, because that's the essence of TV writing is the dialogue. It's the dialogue. Yeah. So sort of like the prose is what scared me. Um, so it's kind of funny that that was the criticism. Your, your dialogue is lacking. <laughs> um, so, so I wasn't worried about dialogue, and I wasn't really worried about storytelling. I think it was, it was, um, you know, it was prose. It was sort of prose as the, you know, is is not, you know, not some people don't read, people don't watch TV for the prose for the stuff that happens between the, the dialogue. Um, so, so that was the tricky part. But, but the discipline, the storytelling you know the my favorite rule of all is don't be boring um you know so i was sort of it was all about the don't be boring don't be boring don't be boring um because then people won't read the book so that that probably helped uh that probably helped the most and also ed and marshall were really good about um a lot and a lot of people don't do this they were really really good about women think this way and men think this way and a good example of that is the 30 something episode where peter horton dies um i wrote that episode and um there's all it's also nancy um has like second look surgery for her ovarian cancer and it's she's it's good like it's the surgery is like it's it's good news um, and Michael comes to the hospital room to see Elliot and Elliot says, you know, Michael, you know, the surgery was great. You know, it, she's cancer free. It's like, great. And I wrote this scene where these two guys are like, oh, it's wonderful. It's fantastic. I'm so happy for you. Blah, 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 blah. And Adam Marshall said, and guys don't talk like that. <laughs> uh, it's like Elliot says, Michael, you know, the surgery went went great and Michael says oh too bad now she's not going to die <laughs> and I mean and that was such a that was such a revelation you know and and the, and a lot of people on shows don't don't teach you that or don't tell you that so you have you know men writing women badly or women writing men badly and I was sort of brought up that always ask a guy is what would a guy do uh, what would a, you know? I, I I guess I know. What would a woman do? You know, um, what would a child do? Um, so that helped a lot too. It's a shame that there's an entire generation of twenty somethings who have no idea what we're talking about with That's the thirty somethings. That Michael and Elliot are buddies, and you know the the ad, the ad agency, and you know it was kind. Of, uh, if this helps anybody, this was kind of the the eighties version of Mad Men in the fifties and sixties. Does that help you at all? I don't know. <clears throat> right, I mean it's it's the way I look at it now. I try to explain it, for, but then of course you get people like, "What's Mad Men?" And then I say, "Go away from me! Stop bothering me!" <laughs> uh, so how did you uh, how did you get your break in Hollywood? You said thirty something was your first gig. I mean that's that's a pretty good place to break in. Well, I went to film school. I went to undergraduate um, at UVA, and then I came out to UCLA to go to film school. And actually, it's a good story. Is um, I met a friend, Dan Pine, who's written a lot of films. He's, he's been but, on the show. Oh, great guy! Really great guy. Um, and Dan got a job on a TV show, um, and they were looking for people to write scripts. And you know, most of us in film school, you know, we wanted to be, you know, you know, Coppola. We wanted, you know, we wanted to make our great, you know, movies. Um, and Dan approached like maybe five writers that he knew and said, hey, would you like to come in and pitch for like this TV show I'm doing? And four of the five writers said, no, I'm a feature writer. And I said, sure, I'll pitch. I'll come in and pitch. And so that's how I sold my first, um, my first TV show, my first TV episode. And so that's kind of how I got, you know, started in 
TV. You know, was, that, I, was that 30 something? No, that was, um, that was Matt Houston. That was action. Matt Houston. And so, wow. And so for a while I was sort of like this token, you know, you know, the chick who could write action, um, you know, car chases and stuff like that, um, which was kind of strange. And then somehow some producers got, some scripts to Ed and Marshall when they were looking for a, a writer. Um, and I had really written mostly kind of action stuff. And, and I remember thinking, is this really going to be a good fit? Because I'm sort of like the bang, 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 you know, writer. Um, and, you know, and I didn't, I didn't really do very well on 30 something when I started. Um, and in a weird way, I, I think the miscarriage helped because it's it sort of like it was the first thing that I wrote where I actually kind of wrote about myself and how I how I was feeling, which, if, if, you know, if you know that show from a long time ago, um, you know, that's, you know, that that's sort of when I finally kind of figured it all out. So um, if, if there was one criticism that could be leveled at that show. And you could have helped, I guess, based on your background. Is that it really needed more shit blowing up at times? Oh well, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would have been fun. You know, yeah. that's the way my buddies and I will talk. Somebody will say, "Hey, this is new movie out. A lot of shit blows up. You want to go?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's. I mean, my my background <laughs> previous to that was my husband and I met working for Roger Corman. So my husband and I, our, our background is like low budget, like so, like really low budget kind of, you know, some crazy stuff. I, I have your book here, and I have the press release announcing your book here, and I, I don't remember a word about Roger Corman. So we're going to we're going to go off the rails right now and tell me about working for Roger Corman. I don't care about the rest of this. Suddenly, I want to know about Roger Corman. Well, my it, my husband was Roger's um, assistant for a while, yeah. uh, and Roger liked to hire his assistants from Stanford, where Roger went. And Julie, Roger's wife, liked to hire people from UCLA, where she went. So John was Roger's assist- assistant, and I was Julie's assistant. Um, you know, and I, I remember when we were there, Catherine Bigelow had done a movie. And I remember sitting in a little screening room as Catherine Bigelow was getting started, and just sitting sitting there. And they did a they did a movie with Jamie Lee Curtis when I was there. Um, but after that, um, my husband and I. John went and did some movies for Charlie Band, and then I did a movie, and you'll never find out the name of it, um, because I wrote it under another name. Oh. And let's just say, I thought it would be a really good idea to start a low-budget movie with male frontal nudity. (sighs) Because, you know, you don't don't see that very often. And I thought, you know what, this is like a shock horror movie, and boy, that'll be really scary. And you know what, it was... It was terrible, and that that ended gruesome in the wrong way. It's really, yeah, it was really, <laughs> really gruesome, um, and that ended. It ended up getting cut. Thank, thank goodness. I mean, it, there there were many jokes there, but um, <laughs> yeah, but I that, guess so. It's a, it's just it's a terrible movie, uh, but um, but so John John and then so John sort of left Roger and made um, a lot of uh, like really cool like low budget movies, and he kind of does that to this day he still will do low budget stuff but that's how I got started um and it was a really great training ground to like write like these like quickie you know action you know sorority girls get killed and stuff like that you know it was it was lots of fun wow I just I I I just heard uh, a podcast I want to say it was Gilbert Gottfried's uh amazing colossal podcast um uh sometime over the last few weeks it went Corman was the guest, and they they talked for like ninety minutes about the movies and all the people whose careers he started, and you know how he obviously works. I mean, you know, I'm familiar with Corman, but it was just fascinating to actually hear it from him. And I know he's written a book, but you know, when you mentioned that, I was like, okay, stop. We have to go back and talk about Roger Corman. That must have been really interesting. It was great. It was really great. And I worked for Julie for I don't know a year and a half. Um, and she finally said, you know what, you're a writer. She read something I'd written. She said, you know, you're a much better writer than you are an assistant. <laughs> and she was, she was right. Um, and so, like, I, I left, and, and, and it was, and I think it was a combination of, of Julie and Dan Pine who said, if you're a writer, you're, you're really going to write. Um, and you're not going to, like, be an assistant, and you're not going to, you're going to starve, and you're going to, like, you know, 
you know, be a waiter, but, but you're not going to like have like a nine to five job because you're really going to concentrate on your writing. And that's what I did. And it's, and it's not like it happened instantly. Um, but I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And then finally, um, you know, it's sort of Dan Pine also said is you have to, you're going to get lucky. And when you get that lucky break, you have to be ready. Um, when you get the lucky break, and that's that's such great advice. Um, and and Dan was Dan was exactly right. Dan Pine, who last I recall wrote, was the maybe was the showrunner on Alcatraz for J.J. Uh, Abrams, which la- lasted a se- season. And he wrote, and I wish now that we've brought it up, I wish I could think of the title of, of Dan's book because it was a wonderful book. Something, something. It was the longest book title I've ever seen for a novel. I, can't, I just can't remember what the title is, but I'll link it, folks. I will link it to at the bottom of this interview. So if you're curious about Dan Pine, you can see it. Uh, there's one other show that I wanted to ask you about before we kind of wrap up. Um, you uh, you wrote an episode of Haven, which um, I found interesting. I love Haven. Been with it since the first uh, first episode. Um, Haven is essentially a science fiction show uh, based on a originally on a Stephen King short story, The Colorado Kid, but I thought it was interesting to see that you had worked on it because, I mean, the essence of it is, and you worked on it early uh, early on, but it, it, it's essentially a show about relationships. I mean, the, the you know, the science fiction stuff, uh, it, it kind of almost plays in the background to the relationship. So I'm just curious, uh, the show, the episode you wrote, I only know of one, uh, Connected, I think it was called? Do you know what? I can't remember. I mean, it was about it was about a restaurant. I mean, I remember because because it was such an early episode. It was when they were still trying to find, you know, their way, and and so so it, it sort of it changed a lot. You know, that it, you know the beginning of any show. Um, a jumping to, to a Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy, like in the beginning, it was sort of what it is now, and then suddenly. It got. It was supposed to be more CSI, and so we had broken like 13 episodes, and then suddenly it was like, no, let's make it more CSI. And so a lot of the humor and sex came out, and then suddenly Desperate Housewives came on and was like a big hit. It was like, oh, maybe sex is, is good. So suddenly it kind of went back. And so Haven at the time, because I, I only wrote an episode. I kind of wasn't part of the you know, creating of it. So I came in to write an episode and it, there was a little bit of, oh, it should be a little more like this or a little bit more like this or a little more like this. So my connection with it wasn't, um, I mean, it's interesting because I did Dead Zone with the, with the same group of people and, and Dead Zone was definitely sci-fi but kind of more about relationships and it was fantastic. I mean, that's like a show, if people haven't seen that, like get the DVDs. It's so good. It's such a good show. Thanks. I just did my little plug for Dead Zone. <laughs> and Haven good. too. Haven. I can speak for Haven. Haven's a wonderful show. We, you know, we we watch that religiously week after week, and we're one of those people who are like, save Haven, uh, yeah. which we don't do a lot of. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, okay. So you brought up Grays. I was I couldn't decide if I was going to bring up Grays or not. When when we what season were you on Grays? I did the first season. The very first. I, just there the the beginning. Yep. So, but I mean that was a show that had that was because I watched. I think my wife and I watched like the first two or three seasons before we threw up our hands and walked away from it. <laughs> I still can't believe it's still on the air. Um, uh, but in the first season, I mean the first episode, it was all about sex, wasn't it? There's a lot of sex. Yeah, I mean, in that in that first episode, um, uh, Gray, whose first name now escapes me, uh, Meredith. Meredith Gray. She, I mean, she has sex with um, Patrick Dempsey. Yeah, McDreamy, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's all about sex, and then we find out that she's got to work with him. She finds out right the next day. That's that's the whole thing about the first episode. Uh, oh my God, I remember the first episode of Grey's Anatomy. Uh-uh. Oh my God. Slap me. Um, I, I'm going to have to go watch some football now. Um, but I mean, it really, I mean, it was, I mean, it was like sex, sex, sex was really, I mean, that was the major reason people watched it at that point, wasn't it? 
I think so. Plus, plus it had like great weird cases, like people, you know, getting like impaled, you know, with like, you know, spears or, um, or like really straight. We, we would watch, you know, like, you know, those weird Discovery Channel shows to find like, you know, oh, here's one about a 600 pound woman, you know, and. You know, I mean, all that, you know, you know, here's a here's a twin who has like another part of a twin attached to him. It was like, oh, let's do something with that. So that was that was really it was really fun. <laughs> so for, for, for the people who are still watching Grey's and who may go all the way back that far or who may just remember it from its glory days, the first couple <laughs> of seasons. Tell us about some of the storylines that you contributed, some of the maybe the character arcs or something. And anything that stand out in, in your mind that. Nothing that like nothing that like nothing that like totally um, jumps out. I mean, I, I tend to I tend to be like a person who wants to ground things a little bit and 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 make sure relationships make sense. And at the same time, it's like could Patrick Dempsey take off his shirt again? You know, <laughs> I'm sort of all about you know I'm all about that. Did you write that into any scripts? Honestly, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure I did. <laughs> You know, kind of anything I write, it's just sort of like there's a handsome act. You know, why? It's because all these shows, like with all these beautiful women, I mean, Modern Family, you know, it's just like, whoa, she's like so gorgeous. You know, and it's like, okay, if I'm going to work on a show and there's going to be like a really handsome guy, you know, why shouldn't he be in a bathing suit? I mean, something for me. Yeah. Well, I, I interviewed uh, Mark Guggenheim, who's uh, one of oh, yeah. the writers on uh, Arrow. And uh, I mean, I didn't ask him about, you know, writing... Stephen Amell uh, with his shirt off, but it just, I mean, it's like in every episode. It's just, and, and I assume that it's just because you got to sell episodes. You want people to keep coming back. And, you know, who knows when that superhero thing's going to wear off, but, you know, guys built like that. Sure. are going to get that crossover audience. People who don't care if he's got superpowers or an arrow with a punt, with That's a, you know, a, a, what is it? Oh, the boxing arrow. That's it. That's the reference. I mean, the. Women don't care about that. Look, he took his shirt off. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's how sure. I got my wife to watch it. I know that. <laughs> yeah, uh, there you go. So you bear responsibility for at least a few incidences where Patrick Dempsey had to take his shirt off. Probably, yes. I, I Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, I, I certainly wasn't the only one in the room saying that, though. Um, you know, gosh, this, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this. My husband's going to go, what did you say? <laughs> no, but, uh, but. I was not alone in in that. Did you have any responsibility for Catherine Hagel taking her shirt off? No, she was um, no, but she, boy, she was when when the show started and all the actors came in and we met them. She was so beautiful. I mean, she's still beautiful. I don't yeah. mean to put it in the past tense, but I mean, she came in and she was oh, she was so lovely. She was so beautiful. Patrick Dempsey came in and all the women just like kind of like just. <laughs> complete to, to mush, you know. Um, you know, it was such a, it, and, I mean, it really was such a brilliantly cast show. I mean, it was really, and, and Peter Horton directed the pilot. I mean, it was so brilliantly cast. I mean, it's, it's a great script. Um, you know, it's a really, really fun pilot. I mean, it's funny that you remember it. Ha-ha. Well, I do. I mean, because, you know, I was like, I don't want to watch this. My wife said, come on, let's just give it a try. And, we, you know, <laughs> we, we'll always try some a lot of sh- new shows when the season starts. Or, that may have been a mid-season show. Is that right? Yeah, it was mid-season. mid-season. Yeah. So it was like, okay, we needed something. And, you know, it looked sexy. And, I mean, Catherine, I wasn't that interested in uh, the, the woman who played uh, Meredith Grey. Uh, I just, I don't know, just didn't appeal to me. But Catherine Hagel was just like, holy Jeez. cow. And, um Ah, there was the woman who came from uh, Arliss, uh, uh, who just left the show. Uh, uh, um, the third female lead on the show. I can't think of her Kate name. Walsh? No. Not Kate Walsh? No. Um, she was on before, even before Kate. She just left the show. Uh, ha, 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 uh, oh, help me. Asian. She's Asian. Oh, Sandra O. Oh. Sandra O, oh, yeah. Uh, I was interested in her because she had just done all the seasons of Arliss, and she was very funny as the long-suffering uh, secretary. I for, I completely like blanked on Arliss. I loved Arliss. Arliss was fun. Arliss yeah. was a lot of fun. Um, okay, so we've kept you a long time here. I need to ask, what are you going to do next? Will it be TV? Will it be another novel? Uh, what's what you know? Where, where are you leading you? 
sort of always both. Um, you know, it is November, which is the month of Nano, which is the month where I write fiction. So I have, it's funny, this morning I hit, you know, the goal, 50,000 words in a month. And this morning I hit 50,000 words. Woohoo! So, you know, it's, I'm not even at the end of November and I hit my 50,000 words today. So I'm writing a new novel about um, kind of the same tone as expecting, but I wanted to write about a middle-aged woman who loses her mother, who has to deal with death. But I didn't want it to be like, you know, dreary and, you know, like, oh my God. I want it to be really funny. So, um, maybe funny, she could, funny maybe, and sad. Maybe she could make a disastrous appearance on a video podcast. There you go. You know, where she thinks I, she's going to be able to talk about it and... It, it all just goes straight downhill from there. I like it. I, so doing that and and pitching pilots. I mean, it's it's so both. So I'm still, you know, still doing TV. You know, writing another book, um, blogging some, which is really fun. I'd never done before, and so that's like writing essays and and so so. I mean, I'm I'm busy, which is fantastic. Awesome. I can I can also imagine a pilot about a video podcast. And who would be who would star in this video podcast? I'm sure, he'd be handsome and take his shirt off a lot. Oh, do you think? Yeah, I think so. You have to take his shirt off. Yeah, that. it rules me out right there. But I think that's what I would do if I were writing it. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> well, this was fun until it went straight downhill. Um, <laughs> Folks, listen, uh, you can find Ann Lewis Hamilton's uh, first novel, Expecting, in great bookstores everywhere, or you can pre- you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. And the way this works is if you're watching this on mrmedia.com, somewhere over there or over there below the video, you'll see a copy of the book. You can click on it. It'll take you to Amazon. You'll get a good deal on the book. You can order it right now. Uh, you can order it. Uh, Amazon can get it to you in 30 minutes or less via drone. Or if you're not in that big of a hurry, that's just what I hear anyway. Um, <laughs> if you're not in that big of a hurry, they can uh, mail you a paperback copy in a, in a day or two. Or you can uh, download it, I'm sure, as an ebook as well. Um, and uh, website, Twitter, Facebook. Are you social media up to anywhere? At, at all? Um, yeah, I have a Facebook. I have a Facebook page. It's Ann Lewis Hamilton. Um, I, I that's the same as my web address, Ann Lewis Hamilton. Yeah, you can visit me there. Facebook. I don't have Twitter yet, but I will soon. Um, I think that's where I am. I think you can find me at those places. I hear that all the cool kids who are authors have Twitter accounts, so they can, you know, tell us in 140 uh, characters or less. You know what their deepest thoughts are, so it's just what I hear. No, I haven't done it yet. I know, just like Skype, I was like, you know, a Skype virgin. Oh, now I'm not. Now You're I'm not. Like, Skype virginity is gone. I, 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 I burst that cherry, folks. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that out loud. Um, all right. Well, Anne Lewis Hamilton, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Good luck with your book, and uh, I hope we'll have good excuse to have you back again. This was fun. Oh, I would love that. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, this is Buzz Burbank in the Buzz Burbank Newsroom, preparing for you another Buzz Burbank News and Comment. Do you like good stories? Boy, I sure do. I turn over a lot of stones each day to make sure I don't miss the best ones. Sure, some make me angry, and some make me sad, and some make me laugh, and isn't that what makes us human? I'm proud of the fact that I pack more news into my 10 or 15 minutes a day than the evening news does in a half hour. It's a free podcast at buzzburbank.com, or you can subscribe free at iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or get it on any RSS device. It's like a newspaper for your head. It's Buzz Burbank News and Comment, another Realm Network presentation. Weekday mornings right here on the Realm Network. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the George and Tony Entertainment Show. Prepare for awesome mediocrity. We're the Cousin Oliver of the Realm Network. I'm George. And I'm Tony. And we're a weekly family-friendly podcast about pop culture. From our point of view. At RealmNetwork.com. The George and Tony Entertainment Show. From the Realm Network. 
It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Hi, this is Mark. And this is Lowell. And if you're fans of Don and Mike, you may know who we are. Our number one interns. You, you've met them on the show. They're the guys that ate all the junk, and they were outside with each other holding hands with a sign that said that they loved each other wearing the dunce caps. And what you may not know is that we started out as fans back in their WAVA days. Hi, Don and Mike. It's Mark and Lowell. Oh, yeah. These are, these are two guys that uh, we once actually called them our protégés, didn't we? And now we have our own show, so we want you to give it a shot. And just check us out at the Realm Network, realmnetwork.com, or you can go to markandlowell.com. The system is futile. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Every Tuesday and Thursday evenings right here on the Realm Network. And catch the Poor Premium Show Friday nights.